Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to watch the recording of the second lecture on financial statement analysis. Please feel free to pause anytime if you need extra caffeine to stay awake or you have to go because of too much coffee. In fact, I'm recording this at around 11 p.m. on Sunday night with some nice coffee. An important message for everyone. As of 28th of February 2021, we have 550 plus students enrolling in this unit and um, that is the largest number of enrollment for this unit in semester one so far. Out of the 550 plus, about 441 students have successfully registered on my finance lab. About 306 students have completed MFL test one so far with a total of 922 attempts. So I would like to emphasize that you can have unlimited attempts before it's due date Try as many times as you want and only the highest grade from each test will be recorded towards your final MFL performance. The second test will be ready by the time this video is made available and I would like to urge you to register on MFL and start doing your first two tests if you haven't done so. You may recall that in week one, when Daniel went through the assessment component for this unit, we allocate 30% of the overall grade to MFL which have about 11 tests overall. In the past, we typically see an average of more than 80% of students who have completed them, but we always have people who receive zero, simply because they never try to attempt it. That's pretty sad if you decide to forego this 30%. All right. So if you need help with any MFL question or any question in general, please post it on the discussion forum um, I'm more than happy to be of as much help as I can. So on your LMAT website, you can see there's a link called Discussion Board on the left-hand side. So click that, you will take you to this page. And you can see that we have eight forums on the Discussion Board. Uh, you know, you see a forum for lecture materials, tutorials, My Finance Lab, blah, blah, blah. I think Daniel has already gone through that with you. So far, we had about 60 posts in Forum 1 and 50 posts in forum three regarding my finance lab and really you can ask anything and if you can't categorize them post it on this linear question forum please um just to make your life easier right um so if you go to one of the forum and if you, you can see it there's a create create thread and it can there's a subscribe button so please hit subscribe to make your life easier so that you get a sort of content update if, if anyone actually asked the question or responded to any of the post and when you're creating a thread make sure that um, you come up with a very self-explanatory title so over here we can have you can see that it was like company versus firm very interesting question very interesting title very interesting question as well and is anyone else confused by the beta spread beta co uh, concept yeah so something like that would be very helpful and i noticed that in forum three there were a lot of uh, threads called FINA 1221. Um, I figured out why, because they have updated the LMS and also the forum function. They changed the default of the subject title to just the subject. So it makes you feel like putting FINA 1221 in the actual title for the thread. But you know, um, anything that is self-explanatory self would, would be clear and would, help, would be helpful for others to navigate into your thread. All right. So weekly important stuff. So this week, the recommended rating is chapter two. You can see I have put a difficulty level here with two full stars and two empty stars. Would you like to guess what they mean? Well, the idea is that in my opinion, the material in this week would be impossible if you decided not to, if you decided to study, to not study the lecture notes, not to attempt the tutorial questions, not to read more on Google or not to read the textbook. And in some weeks, you may be able to cram in the last minutes before exam, but week two, however, is not one of those. So it will be impossible. So two out of two stars for difficulty, and if it and if you decide to give a go, and uh, study it sorrowfully using whatever materials available to you, then this week be then this week will be a piece of cake. So difficulty is zero. This is not a gimmick to lure you into reading the lecture notes, and trust me. It will be impossible if you leave this week until the last minute. Uh, we have five tutorial questions which are included at the end of lecture notes. 
Um, there are currently two ongoing MFL tests, so please pay attention to the due date. So the first one is due in week three Friday. Second one is due uh, in uh, on, on Friday the week four, 19th of March 2021. And they both ended at 11.58 p.m., so just before the midnight. All right. So learning objectives for this week. So know that in item one, we want you to list the four major financial statements and discuss what they are. But to make your life a lot easier, we will only focus on three of the four, balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows. Item two talks about, we would like you to discuss the difference between book value and market value of shareholders equity, which are almost always different, right? And in a few minutes time, we'll share Warren Buffett's view on this. The textbook covers a lot of ratios. Our focus in these units to understand a few important ones, but remember you don't have to memorize any formula for any ratio. In your mid semester exam, as well as your final exam, you'll be able to, I think it's gonna be an open book exam like last year, right? So you can, and you can make your own summary sheet to make your life easier if you don't want to refer to a textbook. So, but the point here is that I don't want you, or not the, uh, not us, Daniel, want you to memorize any formulas. It is a lot more important to understand the intuition behind them. And to make your life easier, um, some slides have highlighted, highlighted headings. So those are the ones that discuss important concepts, which will be directly applied in the rest of the unit. So I will show you the link to later uh, to the later to the weeks that we're going to be discussing them or using them uh, later on. And we're going to have two parts today. The focus is on part one, three financial statements. We'll wrap up the lecture up talking about a number of financial ratios. And I suppose the first question in your head would be, why do we study accounting in a finance unit? Isn't that finance is all about stock market, share prices, mergers and acquisition? All right, let's have a quick recap of what we learned last week, and then we try to answer this question. So last week, you learned about different business forms, starting from sole trader, partnership, and corporations. A company can be private or public, and by the way, in this unit, we use company, corporation, and firm interchangeably. I explain my reasoning in one of the LMS discussion threads, so if you're interested in finding a why, please feel free to browse Forum 01. One of the most important reasons to attract company going public is the ability to raise more capital from ex external investors as well as from internal investors. As a shareholder of a listed company, it is a lot easier to sell the shares or buy more if they want from the market. In comparison, it is a lot more difficult to do, to do so for a private company. So because there are no such active markets to trade the shares. And let's say you want to buy BHP shares, which gives you some ownership of one of the largest mining companies in the world, if not the largest. In a red circle, um, there are two prices here, a bid price of 15.55 and an offer price of 15.6. Which one would you use if you were to, if you want to buy a single share? That depends on how long you would like to wait. If you have no patience and want to buy it straight away during the trading hours, then the price you will use is the, is the higher one, 15.6. 15.6 here is the lowest price acceptable by all the current sellers of BHP shares. And let me repeat that again. 15.60 is the lowest price acceptable by all the current sellers of BHP shares. So if you don't, so if you cannot wait, this is the price that will be charged if you want to buy it. But what if you can wait? Then a the buying price is not so clear. In a nutshell, you will need to submit a so-called limit buy order, specify the maximum price you are you're willing to pay, which is typically lower than the lowest price people are currently willing to sell you for. How many shares you are buying? Your buy order will then sit in the market until another in impatient seller hits your buy order. And to understand a bit more about this, um, there, um, there is a discussion thread on bid and ask. So you may you may see that it was um, in forum or one. Someone asked, uh, is anyone else confused about by bid and spread? So go ahead and, and read it. I think I have put some reasonable in uh, sort of detail enough sort of discussion over there. 
So although we generally refer to the stock market as a marketplace for people to trade shares, we differentiate it by what types of shares are traded. A primary market is where a corporation issues new shares through its initial public offering, IPO, to investors, or seasonal equity offering, SEO, seasonal equity offering. IPO is the first time they sell shares to the, mar to the public market, and all the subsequent ones are then called SEO. So when Facebook became a listed company, if you bought shares in your IPO process, subscribe to their IPO uh, to the new shares, you will be buying Facebook shares from a primary market. And apart from that, all the other transactions related to share trading are all conducted on the secondary market. That is, if you bought Facebook shares during the IPO and then want to sell your holding to fund your next purchase, say of an expensive camera or buying Tesla, then you'll be selling your Facebook shares on a secondary market. But don't get too confused with primary versus secondary market. There is no physical difference between these two. There is the only difference is that when company sells shares in a primary market, the company itself will receive this additional capital. Your buying or selling Facebook shares in a secondary market does not directly matter to Facebook. But of course, you have an indirect impact, which will be discussed further in week eight when we're pricing um, equity. So the focus of this unit is to think as a financial manager with a goal to, maximum, to maximize shareholders' wealth. But how do we do that? We need to know how to value financial asset as a way to figure out what would be the best way to raise additional funding, to finance our investment decisions, and how to value real asset so we can do a proper capital budgeting before we decide which investment decision we should make. And we need to measure risk-adjusted required rate of return so we are able to compare investments that are of different lengths of life. One risky investment takes three years, one less risky investment takes five years. How do we compare them? And we'll learn how to do that later on. But before we can make optimal decisions, what we really need is that we need information. We need to understand how much money we currently have in the company. What do we owe to our suppliers, our profitability figures, etc etc this takes us to the topic of today what we can learn from financial statements or really how do we communicate with other financial market participants using the language of accounting i suppose a lot of you would know about bitcoin which is currently 43,761.10 us dollars Though it has dropped quite a bit from its all-time high, so it may be dropping by the time you read, you read watching this video, it is still very expensive. And I'm going to be quite loose about the definition of expensiveness here. But how many, pe but how many people would know that one Berkshire Hathaway Class A share will cost around $364,580? Just in case if you are not sure what Berkshire Hathaway does, it is the main investment vehicle by one of the richest investors, Warren Buffett, who has a net worth of around 88.6 billion US dollars as of January, which is probably 88.6 billion dollars more than what I have. And speaking of learning how to communicate with your investors, there is no better source than reading the annual shareholder letters from Mr. Buffett. Highly recommended to read them if you can. And I will show you a series of extracts from his annual letters from 2017 to 2020. The first one is his 2017 letter to shareholders that was sent on 24th of February 2018. I've got two parts that have been highlighted with red dash lines um, per share book value, which will be linked to his 2018 letter we'll talk about in a second. But let's read this paragraph. Berkshire's gain in net worth during 2017 was $65.3 billion, which increased the per share book value of both our Class A and Class B stock by 23%. And blah, blah, blah. The format of that op opening paragraph has been standard for 30 years, but 2017 was far from standard. A large, a large portion of our gain did not come from anything we accomplished at Berkshire. That's interesting. Why and how? 
Well, he briefly explains this on the next slide. The new rule says that the net change in unrealized investment gains and losses in stocks we hold must be included in all net income figures we report to you. And that requirement will, produ will produce some truly wild and capricious swings in our GAAP, GAAP, GAAP bottom line. And what's GAAP? What's GAAP? Well, now let, let's move to his more recent 2018 letter to shareholders. Remember how the opening paragraph in his 2017 letter talked about per share book value? It is not there anymore. He started his second paragraph by emphasizing that a new gap rule requires us to include that last item in earnings. As I emphasized in 2017 in a report, neither Berkshire's vice chairman, Charlie Munger, nor I believe the rule to be sensible. So he started his second paragraph by emphasizing that the new gap rule from 2017 really has to specify to include the unrealized capital gain or loss. And on this next slide, he explains why he decides to abandon the reporting of the per share book value. The fact, that, the fact is that the annual change in Berkshire's book value, which makes a farewell uh, appearance on page 2, is a metric that has lost the relevance it once had. I'm not here to be pro or against what he, what he does. I simply want to use his example to highlight that accounting has a set of rules to determine what and when to do what. Even Warren Buffett struggles to find a better way to communicate his success to investors within these rules. And more can be seen in the 2019 and 2020 ones. And I highly recommend you to read them all from the Berkshire website. So you can see where I highlighted the important the two gap components pertaining to capital gains or losses, whether realized or unrealized, fluctuate capriciously from year to year, reflecting swings in the stock market, whatever today's figures, blah, blah, blah. And same thing seen in the 2019 uh, letter. So you can see that um, he struggles to communicate with the investors because he, he has to obey the accounting rules. But it seems like the accounting rules does not justify what he really wants to say. Oh well, we can, we can come back to understand this a bit more later on. But that for those of you who have never, I mean, never dealt with accounting before, you may ask, why do we need to study accounting at all? Well, let me try to illustrate importance using a very simple example. Let's suppose you are inspired by the popularity of apples. You overheard from other students that they wish they could have apples in your lunches, in, in your lunchbox. And so you decide to start an apple booth. And of course, you're hoping that one day your business can take off and become another, another cause. So we have three scenarios over here. Let's go through them one by one. Suppose on day one, you started your fruit booth with $1,000 and you bought 100 kilograms of apples from your supplier for $200. You sold all 100 kg of apples for $400 and you had no inventory left by the, the end of day one. And so if we will summarize all transactions, it looks like you started with $1,000. You went down to $800 due to the cost of $200 inventory. It then went up to $1,200 because of the $400 revenue. In terms of your Apple inventory, it went from zero to 100 kg and then down to zero again. If someone asks you, how's your business on day one, you'll be pretty happy to report a $200 profit. Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? And in our second scenario, suppose on day two, you started your fruit booth with $1,200 from yesterday. You bought 200 kg of apples from your supplier for $400. You hire James as an assistant and pay him 50 bucks for the day. You only sold 100 kilograms of apples for 400 bucks. And you have 100 kg of apples as your inventory left by the end of day two. On the right hand side, we can see that the cash count goes from 1200 to 800, then to 750 and then top at 1150. In terms of apple inventory, we finished the day with 100 kilograms remaining. If you would like to calculate your profit for day two, could that be a loss of $50? Because your cash goes from $1,200 to 
but perhaps not. You still have 100 kilograms of apples, which surely can be sold for something, right? Well, we leave the question mark there. Now let's move on to our final scenario. Suppose on day 3, you started your fruit booth with 11.50 and 100 kilograms of apples from day 2, and you bought 100 kg of apples from your supplier for 200 bucks. You paid 300 as the monthly rent for the booth. You hired James again for 50. You sold 100 kg of apples for $400 and 20 kg of apples from day 2 went bad and couldn't be sold and you had 80 kg of apples from day 3 as your inventory left by the end of day 3 alright so and if you want to find out your profit for day 3 let's have a look so let's look at your cash count so your cash go from 11.50 down to 9.50 because the $200 you paid to buy more apples you go down to 6.50 because, the, because you paid for the rent goes to 600 because you hired James, but now going back to a uh, thousand because you sold something, right? And in terms of your inventory, to 100 kilograms of apple goes to 200 and then go down to 100 and go down to 80 because 20 kilograms of that could, couldn't be sold. So let's say someone asking you, what is your profit? Well, if you're looking at a catch, it goes from 11.50 to 11, to, I mean, a thousand, right? So could that mean the profit is roughly 150? So similar to day two, you still have 80 kilograms of apples. And on top of that, you have also prepaid a whole month of rent, which means for the remaining 27 days, the rent cost won't be incurred again. So from these three scenarios, even just to simply estimate the so-called profit, you can see that it is not as easy as it sounds like. We need rules to guide us what to do in situations like this, which pretty much happen everywhere and every day. All right, so we focus on three types of financial statements in this unit, which are balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flow, and we'll go through each one, each one by one. So now let's look at this question again. Why do we study accounting in a finance unit? One simple answer is that it helps us communicate with other market participants and makes a more informative financial decision. If you want to start investing, say, five grand in the share market, there are about 2,300 companies currently listed on the, on the ASX. Which one should you invest? Large companies? Growth companies? Growth stocks? These two questions are not trivial. For example, when someone says they prefer to invest in a large company, they certainly wouldn't mean the building size of the company's headquarters, right? And when you see these two investors talking about the term growth stocks, and what, and what do they refer to? And from a, from a financial manager's point of view, how could you communicate the success of your business to existing and potential investors so that you could attract, attract more funding and not disappointing your existing shareholders, just like what Warren Buffett does every year? And a major way to do all that is to learn or communicate from your financial statement. The title of our second lecture is Financial Statement Analysis. And what, what are they? Financial statements are accounting reports issued periodically to present past performance and a snapshot of the firm's asset and the financing of those assets. So for a public listed company, you can easily find them on the company's website. So for example, let's say BHP, if you go to BHP's website, click on Investor Center, and then Annual Reporting 2019, uh, not all those reports are required by the regulators, but you can see that. But there are a lot of reports available, and there are three main ones that are all included in the annual report. Balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flow. As a listed company on ASX, you need to file financial results so that some key financial metrics are available to public, not just existing shareholders. So naming convention depends on the frequency. So over here we have if you um, if you sort of uh, announce and issue them on a quarterly basis, that will be 4C, half yearly basis will be 4D, and annual basis will be 4E. It is common to see important figures such as earnings on a half yearly basis. And January, February, March is the report season for half year report, and July, August, September is the typical report season for annual reporting in Australia. And if you're going to start your finance career as a stock analyst, you know you'll be pretty busy around this time. 
And on the other hand, if you work as an accountant or an auditor, your finance friends won't be able to find you in the months leading to the end of financial year. The four financial statements required by the ASX are balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, and statement of shareholders equity. So what are the advantages as inf information so? Comparing to statements or reports that are not audited, these are more credible. Because they are subject to regulatory oversight, they provide a more true and fair view. In other words, a company cannot just describe the profitable activities and hide things that are at a loss. Well, theoretically speaking, they can't, right? They cannot. There are disadvantages as inf information source all are also quite apparent. First of all, what you see in a financial statement is what happened in the past. If a company reports that they have $3 billion cash on hand as of, say, 31st December 2020, it doesn't mean that it will, it will still have a similar amount on 1st of Jan 2021. One way to combat this disadvantage is to require continuous disclosure. They need to file reports at least every six months, and if there is anything material to the shareholders, they will need to make an announcement on the event date. Secondly, because accounting is a set of rules, it is not at all surprising that there are different accounting standards globally. For example, GAAP, you may remember the term from Warren Buffett's um, letters, GAAP GAAP is used in US and pretty much the rest of the world, including uh, Australia adopt IFRS, IFRS. We will briefly cover the difference in a second. Third, a disadvantage is the potential conflict of interest. It is less obvious to see how financial statements can lead to conflicts of interest between shareholders and lenders. For example, if a company chooses to borrow uh, money from a private creditor, such as banks, the company will need to provide additional proprietary information that is typically not available in financial statements that are available to shareholders. And previous, previous literature shows that the decision process on whether to choose private credit typically influences a company's choice on how conservative their accounting reporting is. Financial statements can also emphasize, sort of um, amplify the conflict of interest between management and shareholders. As the simplest example, management need to report your remuneration in the annual report, and not every shareholder is happy to find out their CEO gets paid $400 million in a year that sees the biggest loss in their profit in history. Well, they have to report it, right? And there are many other differences, so feel free to browse on the internet, and um, if you want to have more examples, and please feel free to ask a question on the discussion forum. Generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP, is one that mentioned in Buffett's letter, right? So it is set by the Financial Accounting Standard Board, FASB, to provide a common set of rules and a standard format for public companies' reports. As you can see, if you are an Australian investor and is familiar with all accounting rules here, it doesn't necessarily mean you can, be, you can perfectly transfer expertise to analyzing companies listed in the US. And if you want to find out more about differences between GAAP and IFRS, please feel free to Google them. And um, so here is the definition for IFRS, is International Financial Reporting Standards, set by International Accounting Standard Board, I IASB. So it was established in 2001 by representatives from 10 countries, including Australia, mm -hmm. And since 2005, all traded European Union companies are required to follow IFRS and is used by many other countries, including Australia and um, pretty much everyone except US and Japan. So just in a nutshell, how would, I mean, what's the difference? I guess for this unit, I think all you need to know here is that it's just understand the slide. So gap here, gap is rule-based, rule-based where IFRS, what we adopt in Australia, is principles-based. So a rule-based system has little room for exceptions or interpretation, whereas a principle-based has potential for different, interpret for different interpret interpretations of the same tax-related situation, so which means GAAP will be a, like a dictionary, right? But where IFRS will be like a manual to say what generally can be done but here is up for interpretation. 
all right so if you understand that slide that'll be that'll be enough just for this unit right because we'll be focusing on e first all right so now let's look at the first one and before we begin i want to point out that i have no intention absolutely zero intention in testing your ability to put together any of these financial statements so i'm not going to ask you to do to come to recreate a balance sheet i'm not going to ask you to recreate any income statement i'm not going to ask you to recreate a statement of cash flow that's what will be done in an accounting unit but what we want to learn in this unit here is more important to know how to gather the necessary information from various statements to help you complete your capital budgeting problem or equity valuation all right we're now going to cover the first of the three which is the balance sheet so balance sheet in its simplest form has three components asset liability and shareholders equity the total asset should always be the sum of the total liability plus the total shareholders equity and if the formula is not balanced there's something wrong with your balance sheet right that's something that you want to check first is that even balanced so we can start with an example of a balance sheet here which is table 2.1 from the textbook it is important to point out that a balance sheet tells you what a company has at one point in time so a balance sheet tells you what they have at one point in time so here they uh, that tells you what you what they have as at 31st of December 2017. In the asset section on the left hand side, typically you have cash, accounts receivable, and inventories under the current asset. So current here means less than 12 months. Accounts receivable is the money that you can get get back from your customer within a year. So which means that just say um, if you use your credit card to buy a coffee from business school cafe then from the cafe's perspective your payment would be an account receivable because they haven't received cash from you and they're waiting to finalize the payment from the bank that issue your credit card but then they know but they know that they're going to get a cash back from the, from the bank within a year long-term asset here also known as a non-current asset are ones that have a life longer than 12 months if you own a building with 10 years of useful life it is categorized as a long-term asset on the right hand side you have current liabilities and long-term liabilities which are differentiated by the time duration in the bottom you can see that the total asset is equal to the sum of total liabilities and equity which are 170.1 for 2017 and 128.9 million dollars for 2016. so a balance sheet very importantly is a snapshot in time in time of the firm's financial position snapshot in time also called statement of financial position and the important formulas here we need to know is the asset equals to liability plus shareholders equity which is also known as the book value of equity so assets tells you what a company owns controls and anything that has value liability is what a company owes anything that costs a company money and shareholders equity is the difference between the value of the firm's assets and liabilities so um, we already discussed this before but here I give you some example so cash and marketable securities that have a um that has a duration less than one year will be also part of the current asset inventories that will be current asset and prepaid expenses like rent would also be a current asset which means less than one year um on the liability side um, accounts payable which means something like on your credit card that you will need to pay pay to your supplier short-term debt note uh, especially the term note so note is a special term in finance that are referring to uh, like uh, like a like a like a bond but it's less than one year note and current maturities of non-current debt um, and other current liabilities here will be tax payable wages payable right so for longer than one year so on a non-current assets part we have property net property plant and equipment and something very important here is a, something called depreciation that is what you see from your balance sheet right and accumulated depreciation and also the book value of the asset 
which is defined to be acquisition cost minus accumulated depreciation. And these two are very important for you to understand uh, when you come to the unit, uh, come to the week that doing capital budgeting. The other examples include goodwill and tangible assets and other non-current assets here. So for example, investment in long-term securities. And on the liability side, you have you know, longer-term liabilities. Deferred taxes, long-term debt, capital, capital leases. All right. So here, um, here's the example uh, of the one that we just, we just show, right? Show you asset on the left-hand side, liabilities on equity on the right-hand side. Right. This is really the, in, the, in its simplest format. But if you go to uh, any of these uh, listed companies' uh, balance sheet, you can see that they would, e they would expand that into a much larger format. All right. And here is the first slide that has orange heading. Remember that slides with orange heading contains important asset concepts that will come back and be applied again in the rest of the unit. So here, the first one is the networking capital. Networking capital is the capital available in the short term to run a business. And its definition here is, is defined to be equal to current asset minus current liabilities. So if you get current asset figure from the um, balance sheet, and if you get current liabilities figure from the balance sheet, the difference of that will give you working capital. And firms with low or negative working capital may face a shortage of funds unless they generate sufficient cash from their ongoing activities, which means that, you know, we all know if for anyone who runs business or for anyone who knows like investments in the equity market, you know that cash is the king. It's very important to have a, you know, to have a very healthy working capital. And we will use annual changes in networking capital to estimate free cash flows in capital budgeting in chapter nine. All right, so now the term depreciation. So the depreciation comes from um, non-current, is a comes from non-current asset section. Uh, you can see, you remember, we saw that a few slides ago. And this is an important slide. So please make sure that you revisit this slide whenever you have doubts. So depreciation is a yearly deduction that a firm makes from the value of its non-current assets other than land over time according to a depreciation schedule that depends on an asset's lifespan. It is not an actual cash expense, but represents an estimate of the cost that arise from wear and tear or of the firm's asset. So in the balance sheet, the book value of an asset is equal to its acquisition cost less accumulated depreciation. That's where you find depreciation. In the income statement, depreciation is treated as an operating expense. In the statement of cash flows, depreciation is added back to net income to estimate the total cash from operating activities. We'll use depreciation to estimate free cash flows in capital budgeting in chapter nine. All right, I think I have a video here uh, for you to explain what depreciation is from Investopedia. Uh, but unfortunately, this lecture recording cannot record any sound from my Mac. So please feel free to click the link in the present lecture slide or just Google depreciation in Investopedia, all right? But I just want to quickly sh tell you wh what you mean by depreciation. So let's just say a company buys a large equipment, say for example, a, a, like, a, like an industry level printer, which cost them saying $1 million. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether any printer will cost you a million dollars, but that's just an example. Say that they cost you a million dollars, and a printer can be used for say five years. And if you think about it, right? If you think about, let's say the printer is essential to your business because you need that to print out like product, product uh, description and all that. So you can think about that the printer is essential to your uh, revenue generation ability. So which means, you know, it, although it costs you a million dollars, should I actually go to your income statement in your year one? In, I mean, in, like at a time that you buy it. So which means, you know, we haven't even talked about income statement just yet, but just think about it, right? Think about it, let's just say, it costs you a million dollars today. Although your cash go down by a million dollars, but you know that you have an asset, which is the printer, that will give you 
ability to generate income from that printer over the next five years. So which means you can't just simply say I lost, uh, you know, I lost a million dollars in, ca uh, in cash and, and that's it, it's gone. But no, you, you got an asset. But when you're trying to describe your profitability, your profit, which we're going to talk about in your income statement, you will think about, well, that machine is going to be used for five years. So which means that it is reasonable to evenly distribute the cost of a million dollars over the five years. And that's the idea of depreciation. So depreciation is not something that is, is actually something that is sort of, uh, you could think about artificially created by accountants to trying to adequately, um, adequately trying to, uh, trying to describe that, it, you know, that kind of action that happens when you buy a printer, right? Because it can be used for five years, so which means that the cost should be evenly distributed over five years. And that's essentially what depression does. All right, we're gonna come back to this to that example income statement. I think, and another important aspect of the balance sheet is to tell you shareholders' book value of equity, which is simply the difference between assets and liabilities. Recall that earlier in this in this lecture, we mentioned that Warren Buffett no longer includes the book value of equity per share in his letter to shareholders. It doesn't mean his company no longer reports that in the balance sheet. It's just that he chose not to report that figure up front or have any emphasis on a book value of equity in his letter to shareholders. Um, an important related concept to book value of equity is the market value of equity. So here, book value of equity, uh, we need to know that it cannot, it could possibly, possibly be negative because your asset may be below your liabilities. And many of the firm's valuable assets may not be captured by the on a balance sheet, right? For example, your future income generation ability. That's not captured by a balance sheet because balance sheet tells you what you have at one point in time, right? But in comparison, market value of equity is cannot be negative. Why? Because market value of equity, or also known as market cap, market capitalization, is defined by market price per share multiplied by number of shares outstanding. And given that a share price can't be negative, right? Because your investors, your shareholders are limited to limited to their own initial investment, which means the share price can't be negative. And the number of shares outstanding can't be negative. So here you have two non-active numbers multiplying each other, you end up with a number that is not gonna be negative, right? And this market value of equity often differs substantially from book value because book va value of equity tells you what you have at one point in time and really what you have on paper. But market value of equity depends on the expectations of future risk and return because it comes from the market price of share and share price reflects people's expectations. So when an investor is making up their mind whether to whether to buy a company shares or not, what they care about is that the company in the future will bring back some dividends, some income to them, right? So which means that they want to think about what is the future growth opportunity of the company. The investor not buying a company for what they have today on you know on paper on the on the um, on, on the book value of equity side, right? So. So the price that the share price that she's willing to pay for will be a way to express her expectations of future risk and return of this company. And book value of equity is sometimes used to estimate liquidation value. We can learn a great deal from firm's balance sheet to assess the firm's value. For example, we can take the market to book ratio, its leverage, debt to equity ratio, is short-term cash needs, current ratio. So we're probably gonna focus on one of them. A uh, market to book ratio is a very important ratio, also known as the price to book ratio. It is estimated as the market value of equity divided by book value of equity. So M market to book ratio, market value of equity divided by book value of equity. You also hear about BM ratio, which is the book to market ratio. And what is that? That's just the opposite of that. So that will be book value of equity divided by market value of equity, right? Um, I guess it's just really different people have different preferences. 
So if a company has a low market to book ratio, it is typically known as value stocks. So low market to book means they have more book than what they have from the share price. And on the other hand side, if a firm has high market to book ratio, it is typically known as growth stocks. It is easy to understand why a company can be called a growth stock if it has a higher market to book ratio. So here, which means that on paper, you're only worth your shareholder equity only has $1 billion. But from the market, your share price times the outstanding shares is $20 billion. That just means that people think that you're going to grow grow out of the one billion dollars cash one billion dollars of asset you have right um there is no straight cut to determine what's low and what's high and typically you need to compare with other companies in the same industry and compare the changes in its ratio with the company's past record so which means that you want to compare them cross-sectionally with other companies in the same industry also comparing time series uh, in the time series manner to what you have, what they have in the past. The textbook gives you some statistics on average market to book ratios across different sectors. So it is important to remember that some sectors have higher market to book ratios, um, such uh, so such as when you when you compare utilities with telecommunications services, right? So over here, look at uh, the Domino's Pizza, very high to market to book ratio, but a, as a you know um, as, as a utility on utility sector is you know is a lot lower than Domino's Pizza because they think the utility sectors where they um, uh, is less likely to grow like Domino's Pizza. All right, but just remember that. So even though on, on you know the sector may have a low average, but doesn't mean all companies in utilities. Would have uh, would have much higher or lower growth opportunity than the other sectors. So just remember, this only this is an average figure, right? But when you want to compare a company, you do want to compare apple to apple, pair to pair. So which means you probably it's more interesting for you to compare that company to, for, to the company from the same sector. All right, let's get your pen and paper out. Try our first problem. So problem one. Ryland Enterprises has 5 million shares outstanding. The market price per share is $22. The firm's book value of equity is $50 million. So what is the market cap? And how does the market cap compare to Ryland's book value of equity? And what is the M to B ratio? Right? So I want you to pause this video so you can have a go. All right, now let's go to the solution. Ryland's market capitalization is $110 million. How do we get that? 5 million shares times $22 per share, which is $110 million. The market capitalization is significantly higher than Ryland's book value of equity of $50 million. And the M to B ratio is 110 divided by 50, which is 2.2. We And we're not gonna make any judgment here because we don't know where, which in, sort of what's the industry average from that particular sector, you know, from that particular country. Um, and so we also have that to equity ratio, something that you can uh, obtain uh, from using the information from balance sheet. And is a common ratio used to assess a firm's leverage. How do you calculate that? Is total debt divided by total equity, right? And here's another common ratio that you can estimate from balance sheet again, enterprise value. And so remember this one has orange heading, which means you will come back again in this unit in the future weeks. The different textbooks have different definitions for, for what should be included in, in this formula. So enterprise value here is known as total enterprise value, TEV. It assess the value of the underlying business assets and plus the debt and get rid of the cash part. But you know, different textbooks really could not agree with each other about what goes into the last part. Could be cash and could be uh, could be also excluding marketable securities. 
Um, but I guess what really confused people the most is the minus cash part. So they understand, okay, the enterprise value is the market value of equity plus that, but why do you take away cash, right? So imagine you're buying a company with a market cap of $100 million, and we, use, we like $100 million because it's just a good number to, 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 to talk about. And let's just say they have the market cap of $100 million, $10 million loans outstanding, and $20 million cash. So here, according to the formula, that would be 100 plus 10 minus 20, which gives you 90, right? But why? Why would you minus? Why would you take away cash? So your goal here, let's just say your goal here is to buy the entire company. So we will need to buy all shares from existing shareholders because you have to acquire the company, which is $100 million. And once you have the company, you will need to pay back its creditors, which means you need to prepare for another $10 million to pay back its loans, right? And once you own the company, its $20 million cash becomes yours. So you can try to estimate, so you can think about it, right? Trying to estimate the enterprise value, you need to subtract the cash amount because once you acquire the company, the cash is yours. So that should, not, that should reduce the amount of money you need to prepare to buy this company. So which means that you can prepare to $90 million with, uh, on hand, buy the company, and pay back the loan, and then you can claim that $20 million cash, right? So of course, this enterprise value figure doesn't exactly tell you how much a company is worth. Because if people learn about your intention of purchasing this company, there will be bidding activities to buy shares ahead of you, and then hoping to sell them to you at a higher price. That's what people do, right? And if you wanna, if you wanna learn how to, not, not, not to avoid it, but learn the market structure over it, there is a unit in a third year called um, Trading Market Security. It's a very interesting unit, right? So, okay, well, so we have a weekly game trivia in our online lecture. Um, and today, the first question in our series is that, what is the first Tuesday of each month except January? What is the why is the first Tuesday of each month an important day for the Australian market? Have a think, right? Um, and if you're not sure about the answer, you can ask that question uh, on a discussion forum, and I'll probably I probably will raise a question if no one asks, right? But please feel free to Google it to learn about why the first Tuesday of each month is an important day for the Australian market, not to the U.S. market, but for the Australian market. All right. So we have now introduced balance sheet. Now let's move on to the next one, income statement. Also a very, very important one. So here we have a typical income statement. As the name suggests, an income statement should give you an idea of the income earned by the company. And an important bit here over here is that unlike balance sheet, which gives you a value at one point in time, income statement tells you a duration, tells you over a period because it tells you, okay, over that 365 days between 2016 to 2017, it's actually pretty, it's actually 366 days because it's a leap year in 2016. Um, so it tells you, it tells you that, you know, um, in that year, what is your income over that entire year? Not at one point in time, not on the last day of the year, but over the entire year. All right, reading from top to bottom, you almost, always start with total sales revenue sometimes called revenue and unlike a balance sheet tells you you know um tells you uh at one point in time it tells you over a period that's something that i just want to repeat over and over so you would get so that, that will essentially go into your mind hopefully eventually go into your mind that income statement is over a period of time so we have total sales cost of sales that gives you gross profit the difference of that and then you minus the selling general and administrative ex expenses, for example, your staff salary, that'll be, that'll be, that'll be, that'll be that one. And then minus the R&D cost and then take away the depreciation and amortization that gives you operating profit. And if there's no other income that becomes your earnings before interest and tax, EBIT. And then you pay your income expense, you can pay your income interest on income, and then you get a net profit before tax and then you pay your taxes, 
and uh, give you net profit after tax. And that's what we call it. The net profit after tax is really the profit that people usually talk about, earnings. Earnings, net profit after tax, net profit after tax, that's the earnings. And from that one, we can then calculate EPS, which is earnings per share, right? Earnings 2.0 divided by number of shares outstanding. All right, so just bear in mind that this is not an accounting unit, that you're not supposed to put together an income statement. I'm not gonna give you a few numbers to say complete this table. I'm not gonna do that. All you need to do here is to get the information out. For example, if I wanted to, to say, what was the depreciation expenses in that in 2017? Well, you should come back and say it was $1.2 million. And then you can tell me, okay, what is the EPS from, that, from 2016? It was 0.53. Um, oh, uh, the one other term I didn't talk about, which is diluted EPS. Um, so diluted EPS, okay, I don't think that's going to be overly, uh, we, we don't going to overly emphasize on that term over here. Um, but diluted EPS is the net profit after tax divided by number of current outstanding shares plus additional convertible shares, right? But that's just a definition. We're not going to sort of elaborate on that point. But EPS is very important because that's something that we always talk about in the market. So the income statement, as we just saw in that example, shows you the flow of revenues and expenses generated by the firm over a period of time. And sometimes it's called a profit and loss statement or P&L statement. And it's not necessarily a guide to future, future cash flows or future income flows, but it's very important for people to compare it with companies' previous year's figures. So that's pretty much all the time when people want to think about what is your profitability of this company, how is the earnings, you know, what is the earn trajectory for the earnings. Then people compare and say, okay, 2020, they earn about the net profit was say $3 million. In 2019, it was $2 million. In 2018, it was $1 million. And th there we go, you have a good story because it's going up, going from one to two to three, right? And analyzing this trend across time is a basic but vital skill in finance. And the last or bottom line of the income statement shows you the net profit, which is the key figure that people care about. It's a measure of its profitability during the period and also refer to the firm's earnings. But because it's so important, companies will try to try a way to, I wouldn't say manipulate, but trying a way to play around these numbers, right? And we will have an example in one of our uh, in-class exercises later. And one of the more relevant aspects as to what we do in this unit is the depreciation, is a deduction to your profit. So we talked about depreciation before. Imagine you bought a $1 million worth of, prop, uh, of printer and we want to say that's, that is a cost. We know that's a cost, right? That is an expense, but we don't want to expense $1 million straight away. If it can be, if it can be used for five years, we want to expense say $200,000 every year for five years. And that's what you call a depreciation, right? Um, so although depreciation here, as you, can, as you can imagine, is not a cash transaction because that $1 million is paid, paid up front and then you depreciate that over say five years. But what people trade it as is that it can be used as a tax shield to reduce tax liability. So over here, think about this. So if you don't have minus 1.2 over here, right? Your interest, so your net profit before tax will go up and which means you'll be paying more taxes, right? So remember depreciation here is not a cash, not a cash item. So it's a way here to use, to reduce your tax liability. And that's perfectly legal because that's what we do, right? That you, you, we, we define that something to be and we'll play it with the rules. We'll cover more about this in week nine, capital budgeting. Next one is another slide with orange uh, orange heading, earnings per share. So earnings per share is from, um, you know, we talk about it from the income statement 
and we obtain the net income which represents the total earnings of the firm equity holders and divided by shares outstanding so um, and, um, and the other one is diluted EPS which is including additional shares that is not outstanding at the moment but will be outstanding will be convertible in the future to the um, to the denominator right earnings per share very important okay and the other two important ratios here are uh, return on equity ROE and return on asset RA ROA right so investment returns return on equity is evaluating the re firm's return on investment by uh, co by comparing its net profit to in investment sometimes you do that by net profit divided by book value of equity sometimes you can also have net profit divided by market value of equity but it's probably more uh, more common to see net profit divided by book value of, of, of equity ROE and ROA is the same thing net profit coming from income statement divided by total asset comes from balance sheet right just two different ways to measure investment return because think about that you think about you you build a company right you build a company from from ground uh, from scratch and here the company gives you some net profit you want to think about here's how much money I put in um, or you know and what's the return what's the what's the returnability right and one more ratio is probably this is one of the you know the most important ratio people use is called price earnings ratio so um, analysts and investors use a number of ratios to gauge the market value of the term of the firm sorry of the firm and the most important one is the firm's PE ratio price earning ratio so how do we get that price earning ratio is market capitalization divided by net profit which um, which if you uh, if you put put everything in market cap, market cap equals to share price times number of shares and net profit divided by number of shares give you EPS earnings per share so which means PE ratio can be rewritten as share price divided by EPS so what, what does a high PE ratio imply so let's just say if you have a PE ratio of 6 it tells you that for every dollar the company earns as a profit the higher the PE ratio the more money an investor would like to pay for the company's shares which means if a PE ratio is 6 for every dollar the company earns investor is willing to pay $6 for it it may not make sense just yet but think about share price represent investors expectation on future growth opportunity so which means a high PE ratio implies that a company may not yet have the profitability that matches with the share price but investors believe this will happen in the future so feel free to go Google what is the PE ratio for Google Apple and for Telstra the Australian company right go ahead and just just look it up see where you can find it right if you can't find it probably put, put a question on discussion forum we, we can elaborate on, over there um, so DuPont identity so this line is a rather fancy way of expressing return on equity which is the net profit over book value of equity right so this clever transformation is known as DuPont identity which illustrate a ROE figure can be interpreted as a product of three other figures it also shows you that although the matching accounting is not at all that difficult it can be confusing to outsiders and that's the point right it's not exactly difficult it's not hard it's just one divided by the other right and you, and you just for example we go from net profit over sales times sales over total equity um, and then sales total equity can then becomes uh, you know why would you have that why would you times time total asset and and over total asset on the second last row it's because you can then sort of like um, move it around such that it becomes three other ratios we won't spend too much time on DuPont identity in this in this unit right I don't think that's gonna go into exam at all right not gonna be your mismatch exam not gonna be your final unit all right now let's get your pen and paper out again for the second problem this question can be confusing to many people 
and the purpose of giving this example lies in the discussion for part C. So please pause the video to at least give it a go. And because the question is pretty long, I'm not going to rate it to bore, to bore you, right? So please rate it, please pause and rate it and give it a go. All right. So here is the answer and I'm just going to quickly read the question over here. So what does part A want? So the part A want here is that the AHP want to develop the product in-house. What would have what would happen if the uh, what would the impact be for the development cost on the AHP's EPS earnings per share? So over here, if AHP develops the product in-house, its earnings would fall by five hundred dollars times one minus thirty-five percent. Um, so with no change to number of shares outstanding, its EPS would decrease by zero point zero five. Where do you get zero point zero five from? is $325 million divided by 6,500, 6.5 billion share, shares to $0.75. Originally, it was 0 0.8, right? So this one requires you to understand what happens in the income statement, right? So if you have more expenses, if you have larger expenses, you're gonna ha you're gonna pay um, lower tax, but of course you're gonna have lower earnings. So, and this is what happened over here for the first one. And the second one, second scenario is to think about if the company is gonna acquire the technology for nine hundred million dollars worth of its stock. So let's just say I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna uh, develop in house. I'm not gonna be, it's not gonna be my R and D cost, but I will issue new shares. And how many shares should I should I issue? Well, I need to raise $900 million and assuming that my share price is not going to change during this process. So I have $18 per share. So that means 15 million new shares. So since earnings here, um, so, so there's nothing changed to my earnings per se because it doesn't change my income over the year. There's no new expenses. There are no new revenues. What it does change is that you're gonna change my number of shares outstanding. So earnings without this transaction, we have an EPS figure, which is 0 0.8. So EPS, the old EPS is 0 0.8 times 6.5 billion, which is $5.2 billion. And that means the new EPS will be $5.2 billion divided by 6.5 billion shares plus 50 million new shares, which is 0 0.794, all right? So if you're not sure, definitely pause and sort of rewatch that part again. But the most important part of this question is to think about why do we need to know this? Well, the question here for part C goes very easy. Which method of acquiring a technology has a smaller impact on earnings on EPS. Is this method cheaper? Well, comparing, let's say, if you understand how we get A and B, you can see that for A, it goes from 0 0.8 to 0 0.75. For B, it goes from 0 0.8 to 0 0.794. So which means acquiring a technology would have a smaller impact on earnings, but this method is not cheaper. Why not? Because here, the first one will cost you roughly $500 million R&D cost, right? And, but the second one, it costs you $900 million. So developing in in-house is less costly and provides an immediate tax benefit because you will pay less tax. But the earnings impact is not a good measure of the expense. In addition, Know that because the acquisition permanently increases the number of shares outstanding, you will reduce AHP's earnings per share in future years as well. So not everyone would get the part A part because part A is quite uh, not that exactly um, straightforward. So here I include a um, sort of like a little table to show you. Um, I think this is borrowed from the actual income statement of the um, 
of the textbook example. So here I show, so I, so I illustrate you that what if there's additional $500 million worth of research and development cost, and what would I go to? Assuming there's no change to everything else. So not exactly zero, but assuming everything else not changing. So the marginal change only comes from the R&D, right? As you can see, if you keep reading, the, um, with the 35% tax rate, the net profit would go down by $325 million. All right. So this is a very important question. So, oh, by the way, um, so reading all these accounting statements can be a great fun. And here's a great example by Schlitt and Perlo and Engelhardt. So this is a great book. So if you need motivation to master your accounting units, and this is the book that you should at least borrow from somewhere, from the library. Financial Shenanigans, fourth edition, how to detect accounting gimmicks and fraud in financial reports. I read a third edition quite a few years ago, and I highly recommend this one. All right, so the third statement is the statement of cash flow. So again, we start with an example of statement of cash flows. It has three components, a section for operating activities, a section for cash from operating activities, and a section for investing activities. You may wonder why we, why we would need a statement for just cash flows. Remember, cash is the most liquid form of assets. And you probably have heard about a term called cash is the king. It is extremely important to understand the cash position of the company. So the company may be able to generate you a lot of earnings and you may be able to, you may have a huge asset, number of assets on, on, on paper. But if it doesn't have cash, if you can't even cover all the short term liabilities, you can't even ca cover the, um, you can't even cover the um, salary, for example. Then you know the company is not going to be solvent for, for, for long. All right. So here, a statement of cash flows. So why do we need, need to know that? Because net income, your, your profitability, earning profitability, typically does not equal the number of the amount of cash the firm has earned, right? Um, because there are non-cash expenses, for example, depreciation and amortization. And use of cash not included on the income statement. For example, you have investment in property, plant, and equipment, right? It just um, it just bought, like 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 we said, um, one million dollars worth of a printer. Doesn't actually go into your net income directly, right? So you want to know about your cash position. So the firm statement of cash flows uses the information from the income statement and balance sheet to determine how much cash the firm has generated, how that cash has been allocated during the set period. Right, and right. So there are three sections in, in the statement of cash flows as we saw from that example: operating activity, which is generally income statement items. So, gen so the income statement item go into your operating activity, and investing activity contains balance sheet items and buying and selling of non-current assets. And financing activity also has uh, balance sheet items, which is the movements in non-current liabilities and equity, the financing activity, right? So here, I help you point out where you see the depreciation again in the operating activities. So income statement, we mentioned that depreciation is used to reduce the taxability as an expense. So however, this is not a cash expense. So which means that you need to add back depreciation to your net profit to work out your actual cash balance, right? Because your earnings is the um, the remaining profit that you generate from your income statement, but depreciation was used there to part of your expenses to generate the number, so which means that you have to add back your depreciation to your net profit to tell you how much cash you actually have, right? This will be examined again in week nine capital budgeting, but, but I highly recommend you should just read a textbook with the relevant part of that and understand why, right? If you're not sure, please post a question on the discussion forum. Retain earnings. So firms retain earnings for the year is the difference between a firm's net income from income statement and a statement of cash flows and the amount that it spends on dividends from a statement of cash flows. So here, return earnings equals to net income 
minus dividends. And in net income can be found in both income statement and statement of cash flows, and dividends can be found from statement of cash flows because it pay dividend in the, in the form of cash, right? So, and this is a very important figure to help you in pricing equities in figure in week seven. For now, just understand that how it is estimated from which statement, return earning, right? Return earnings used for what reason? Well, to grow the business in the future, but we'll talk about it in week seven. Okay, the last section is on financial ratios. In fact, this is a self-study section. I'm not the biggest fan of many of these ratios, but it's important to understand how they are constructed, what information do they contain, and what information do they omit if investors simply focus on certain ratios, right? And previously we talked about EPS with our our um, second exercise example tells you how people can play around with the EPS. You can choose a more expensive strategy, but to have a less impact on EPS, right? So there are many, many different ratios, but I'm not even gonna read them out, right? Um, here are some other examples. And I give you some sort of um, quick way to, to, to sort of, sort of to, to understand what they represent. And typically, if you buy a research from um, from a seller, from a seller side, so over here, Macquarie Private Wells, a, um, a sort of, you can think about it as an advisor, right? Uh, but they are sitting on a seller side because they provide financial services. So over here, you can see that all these, like, all these figure, um, like EPS, and RA, RE, they already, were already calculated for you, right? Because everyone just would presume that will be just calculated, made available for you to, in, for you to interpret over a time train from 2012 to 2015, for example. And there are a number of interpretive is issues. So when comparing ratios, you have to be very certain that they have been calculated using the same definitions or classification. For example, ending value versus average values and ratios only take on meaning uh, when comparing the sum norm of standard. And one of the most important steps in ratio analysis is choosing an acceptable benchmark. So which means that determining the optimal level for the particular ratio and then deciding on acceptable deviation from this target. I just say if you if you believe the ratio should be 5.2 and you should then think about what is the sort of like what is the uh, what is acceptable range for for that ratio, which means that it could be going from 4.8 to 6.5 before you actually uh, before you actually ring uh, sort of um, sound the alert and ratio analysis does not provide answers it simply provokes questions which means which means that you know um, in, in, instead of instead of reading the 70 pages balanced uh, sort of uh, annual report you do some ratio analysis and then you, and then you point out to to think about okay this company looks like very financially look, look very healthy, but some of these ratios does not add up, which means that the answers still need to be found for those questions. And sometimes a bad ratio is more informative than a normal ratio. And that's why people like doing ratio analysis because it gives them a shortcut to go to, to identify what's the most important. If everyone has time to read 70 page report, um, that that's great. When I was a research, uh, uh, when I was a research assistant, when I was doing my PhD for one of the project, I had to read about uh, three years of report for five hundred companies. That's fifteen hundred reports, and each one was roughly a hundred pages in PDF, and that's a lot of readings. But well, anyway, um, you don't have to worry about that. This is the finance unit. We're gonna focus on how to interpret some of these numbers and how well to obtain these numbers. And that's it, everyone. So please make sure to have a go at his tutorial questions. And um, you will see Daniel next Monday in West Farmers Lecture Theater. Have a good day.